Hi everybody, I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Welcome to another episode of Art Matcher, the podcast. Special guest in the studio today, Dominic Lopez. We uh, recently had an exhibition for him in July, solo exhibition, Lifeline. It was a great exhibition for those uh, who uh, didn't get to see it. Hopefully you'll check out his stuff on social. Dominic, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I mean, we just had a great uh, solo exhibition that you uh, curated. Um, but I'm here, you know, getting after it. Um, really enjoy what we had just recently in July. But yeah, I, uh, backgrounds kind of grew up in Michigan and uh, went to school at the United States Naval Academy and uh, served my country for six years. And um have been in film and entertainment and um, hitting the canvas is hard. Now, it's interesting because that's a polarizing kind of background going into the military, which uh, thank you for that. Oh, all right. Serving our country. Got a shout out to the vets. Um, Because the creativity started much earlier. It didn't start. It started from a very young age, correct? Yeah, I mean, as far as back as probably around uh, first or second grade, I really enjoyed um, painting, drawing, and writing poetry. I always uh, would do that kind of before I went to bed as kind of a calming, meditative thing to kind of end my day. Did you keep a journal? I kept a journal, and uh, but most of the time it was just kind of writings about what I would think about, what I would experience and kind of, you know, put that out. Just, it was mostly for myself, but I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Did you come, uh, I never asked this, but did you come from a family of creatives? Is anyone else in your family uh, an artist of some sort? My grandpa, uh, he used to kind of draw a lot, but not really like immediately. No one um, really like my sister's um are not in the uh, artist background, really. Do they have an appreciation for it? Yeah, one of them uh, flew in for them. One's a doctor and one's uh, in finance. But uh, So that's kind of the direct opposite of uh, artist. But uh, they support me a lot. But you, you, you also dabble in the uh, financial sector as well. So you're not a stranger to uh, economics. No, I mean, that's kind of my background. Uh, business, I uh, studied economics at the Naval Academy. But... Uh, Early on, it was really just uh, trading and finding vehicles to kind of um, create more capital. That was always finance, um, and that always interested me a lot, and uh, I was always finding new ways to do that. So that's kind of like really where I was at in my uh, 20s. And does any of that then translate into the influence of your work, like visually or aesthetically? I mean, a little bit. I mean, there's some, you know, references to money or capital or the bag, so to say. And, uh, <laughs> but um, I think it's uh, it's interesting when you merge those uh, two worlds, of, like business and art, and uh, whether it's on the campus or whether it's kind of just in the art world as a whole. But uh, I mean, I think that's where. Uh, the, the cross intersection is very interesting. Some people are of the philosophy that the two shouldn't mix. And for me, being in the space of distribution, I feel like they kind of have to mix because the people who are patronizing the, the work oftentimes sometimes think about work uh, as a financial vehicle or as some type of investment. Do you have any thoughts on how people perceive your work or how, what's your thoughts on why do you think people should be getting your work? 
I mean, I think it's the old adage of when the artists are out to eat at dinner, they talk about money and the businessmen when they're out, out to eat, they talk about art, right? But, you know, I don't really feel that that needs to be the case, whether you're an artist or a businessman. Um, I didn't know the businessmen talk about art. I thought they just flex on the art that they have. No, I, like I think just... it's all about, yeah, that is the flex though, right? I mean, because... That what they're doing is they know they're you know they know how to move around their capital, but the arts like something that fascinates them and that they um, can actually use that you know as an investment. Like you said, I think I think a lot of my pieces are investments. I think of them a little bit as like property. Um, you know, if someone's buying a rental property, you know, and they're collecting on the rent on the property. And then after a while, they sell the property for more. I mean, that's kind of how I think of the art, you know? Yeah, but some would say, you know, the property, you know, can generate cash flow. It's something that's useful. I was just having a conversation with somebody yesterday um, who asked me about how do you know, you know, what are the most valuable things in life, like dollar wise? And I said to them, you know, what I've learned in the 14 years and being in this crazy industry, the luxury industry, because I've, I've also dabbled with watches and cars, the less functionality something has, the more money it could be worth. Meaning, like when you take a painting, the most expensive painting, Salomon Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci that sold for 450 million, you know, you can't eat it, it can't, you know, it's it's just there for pure enjoyment. It doesn't have a functionality. Even versus the most the most expensive car in the world will not trump the most expensive painting or diamond as of as of what I know yet. Um, what do you think about that idea? I mean, it, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because yeah, there really isn't any functionality in it, but it. But there's a difference in functionality and utility, and uh, utility can be derived from when I when I see certain paintings that I've made and I look at them, whether or not that makes me happy, whether that makes me feel a certain way, or whether that just makes me feel alive. Um, I think that's why a lot of times, I, I mean, some pieces I. You know, it doesn't matter really what someone's asking for or say they'll give them for me because I don't want to not be able to look at them. It's almost like it does enough for me that any type of money at a certain point sometimes doesn't cause enough utility for me than just being able to look at and have that visceral experience. I know everyone always says, oh, but you have your price, right? Or you have your price, but, but do you? Sometimes things are worth more. You said something that's very interesting. You know, what does it do for you? And it's interesting because I think that's the trouble in the art industry is like most people will not get that. More people would get the the high feeling from like driving a sports car that other people could admire or having a watch that other people could see. Because I think most people do things not for themselves, but for others truly. I, for, for me, me collecting personally watches and liking nice things, I personally only do it for me. I don't care about anyone else's opinion other than my own when I'm, when I'm buying something with my hard earned money. No, like I just, I uh, like someone, I don't have to ask someone's opinion. Like, Oh, what do you think of this watch? I'm like, I don't care what you think. It's great to me. I, I like, like I fell in love with it. So my question to you is when did you start having not only appreciation for your own work, if that's always been, because I know some artists are tormented in that sense, but appreciation for others as well and the, what they do. Yeah. I mean, I've always followed um, the greats or, you know, artists. Now I get a lot of looking at other people's work Um more so, you know, in person or owning that. Um, I get a lot of value in that, but I also get a lot of value in owning someone's and it continues to appreciate or then selling it. Um, and that's great too. Um, but kind of when 
going back on what you said, like looking at some of my works, it's the being in front of it and kind of like feeling alive is that 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 visceral experience that I get from my work is that like constant reminder that sometimes I need that like, hey, you know, because I feel like we go about the day in a sense like robotic, like we're making all these decisions or our thoughts and our emotions. And we're kind of like in this cylindrical pattern of life and that we don't realize it. But when I wake up and I see, you know, a work that I created that gives me this like, wow, like I'm alive because it like stops me when I look at it, it kind of stops me. And, you know, I feel like I have other artists I get to see and that does the same thing. But for me, my work just, it's this, that. Is it similar to like looking in the mirror? It's a reflection in, in some, in some way. It just you're, you're like looking at your own work and let's say admiring your own work is very different than looking at someone else's because after you've done your work, you know, I know a lot of artists, they look at their work and most of them say, ah, you know, I wish this was like that or, or I could have done this or they, tr they try and pick it apart. For me, when I'm done with my work, I like seeing it like that's a moment in time. That's a piece of history. I'm now moving forward. So like when I thought when I, when I was in the studio creating it and I said it was done there, it's done for me. Yeah, I mean, there there's many ways to, you know, look at it or from whose perspective and and everything. But what I'm really trying to say is that when I look at it and I feel alive, like you like you said, someone gets a sport, you spends, you know, a quarter million dollars on a sports car or whatever, and then they're flying around and they're like, Oh, I'm so alive, it feels so great, right? Sure. But when, when I look at my work, it's like I have that feeling that a lot of things in life don't give me. And you can't, you, you can't really put a price tag on that. But are there, so is art unique in sense it's giving you something that's so different? Because like the sports car, the adrenaline, let's say, I've always thought about this idea of like, let's say someone says, I like a Ferrari, right? And you're like, okay, great. Why do you like a Ferrari? And he's like, I love to go fast in my Ferrari. And I think about it like, okay, you can go fast in any other car, right? You can't even take a Ferrari out on our streets and really push it to what it's capable of doing. Very few people even get to do that. And the ones who own it even. So I wonder if you blindfolded someone or like you put them in the cabin of the car, you don't tell them it's a Ferrari or whatever it is. You just put them in a cabin and they can't really see what it is and they're just going fast and truly then they're experiencing what fast is. The one thing they're missing is whether they're going fast in a Honda Accord or a Ferrari, right? That feeling could be achieved in both cars because the only thing that's measuring it is speed, right? It's not the visual or like, you know, the, you know, the Ferrari, of course, going to have a nice steering wheel or whatever, but imagine they're just like saying, Hey, I do this for the speed. Then you can achieve that in, in any automobile. But the reality is, I think is, and this is just my thought process on it is I feel like the person who has a Ferrari or a luxury car or a hypercar, whatever you want to call it is when they're in that car, they go, I've worked hard. This is, I'm going to show the world. Like, this is my value. This is like, it's an extension of them. And that's why I think it's, it's interesting just how like you can look at a uh, people's animals and you're going, Oh wow. That dog totally sit, you know, fits that owner. The car is like an extension of us, of, you know, how we're, our, like our, our alter ego in a way or something. So with art, because you can't like carry around that you have huge paintings, you can't just be like, check this out, what I have in my house. I mean, they might have a $10 million home and then they go, whoa, I got a Dominic Lopez in my, in my foyer. You know, maybe that's the flex then, but it's not like the day-to-day -day things like the clothes, the shoot, you know, the cars, the, the watches, the jewelry. And I think that's why a lot of people, it's hard for them 
to get that feeling that this is valuable. This is worth something to me. Yeah. I mean, for someone getting one of the paintings, I, I just urge them to, you know, they might be able to see it in pictures if they can't see it in person, but to have that experience in person and see then from that, you know, if it means something or means enough to them to put it in so they can see it every day, you know, kind of like I'm able to see it every day. In terms of the body of work that we exhibited to the work that you're doing now, what are the biggest changes? Because you started creating some stuff with some different funky colors you were showing me. Tell me a little bit about that inspiration of that, these new works that you're, you're working on. Yeah, I mean, I think through experiences and that the, there's always, you know, new iterations of kind of how we're creating or how we're painting. And um, I'm kind of, you know, in that space where I'm creating some new iterations from what people have seen before. But if they look at it, they know that I did it. So it's, um, you know, it's still in the same framework. It's still in, you know the same style, but it's also going to be like, yeah, that's, that's different. But is there any, is there any new influences or are you still building off the kind of, cause you have certain works that have this continuous line that's going through it. I mean, we took the, the, the title of the show lifeline was kind of like inspired by that work where it felt like felt like lifeline. So I saw a couple of them that you were working on where you have that line, but we showed a lot of the works here in the gallery that had this face, this kind of signature face, kind of happy and creepy at the same time. So where, where did that kind of, is it a motif with that kind of symbol that it's not a symbol, but where did that kind of uh, imagery come from? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, everyone gets influenced from, you know, everyone of the past. I mean, no one's really not creating something in, in, in some sort of derivative of what they've seen. But like I said, when I... Um, but you're repeating it, so like... The repetition of what comes out of me is more like from the source. It's not it's something that's always been and will always go. And that's where like clear mind, no thought mind, clear mind. And that's where that comes from. That comes from, you know, this infinite source and that's how it shows up through me. Okay. So it's this infinite source. It's built in you. When was the first time you though, because yes, we're all influenced, we're seeing things. And then the moment it comes out of your hand, it's your language. It's a unique language. It's yours. Even if you were looking at something as you're creating it, you're just trying to even replicate something that what's coming, whatever you're doing is yours. It's coming from your hand. So when was like the first time this kind of, and I'm talking about the image with the swirly eyes and the, the giant smile do you remember when the first time you put that on paper to canvas or yeah i mean it's probably been you know three three years or so um kind of with the faces and that's kind of you know creating its meditative and manifesting you know at the same time and that's just uh what continues to come out of me um and make me be present and and you know when i see that that's what i said i have an experience a visceral experience with you know looking at it and that i'm there that i'm planted and that you know i'm right where i need to be but that moment when you first created it i mean you didn't have the foresight that you're like yo this is gonna be repeat it throughout till now or it, are you done with the face no it's it's something that um 
enjoys coming out of me in you know new new ways is uh, it subconscious though or is it conscious it's like i said it it's not coming from like thinking in front of the canvas it's coming from what's always came i feel like i'm an inception right now i just recently another thing that just popped into my head because i wanted to talk about it is i saw recently on social you did like this refrigerator where is that refrigerator right now that was uh that was a the refrigerator was a big purchase so um you know i had it uh done and uh and someone's enjoying it thoroughly oh is that a commission and i don't i i haven't been doing commissions that was one that uh no i was just wondering did you find that on the street or someone brought the refrigerator i brought it in and uh did it oh see this is the crazy thing when i saw it, this is why the context of where the image is being shown initially when i saw the image i was like did he just find like a refrigerator on the street and just started tagging it and like just left it there or like i thought it was like a pretty clean refrigerator too so i was like damn someone's leaving a bratty refrigerator out there <laughs> so that was that was a recent work yeah that was a recent work but that, ever... that was kind of the the same type of uh style stylistically as that was shown at the show a little bit yeah, yeah aesthetically the, yeah. the red the black the white and that that one had a lot of truth to it so i think that's what we um when we fall back into ourselves then we can really see was that a new what was it like because in the show we showed um four pieces that was on non-traditional mediums the kind of french doors and the doors which we then created into an archway um was any of those kind of seeing your work uh, curated and represented in a different manner? Did that draw, did that bring any new ideas into how you're working now? Well, I mean, I love to, um, you know, create on stuff outside of, you know, canvas. Um, for me, it's like really exciting. It's just like breathes new, new life. Um, I mean, I love going on canvas, but it's just something about like, like those French doors, like how you had it set up between or, um, you know, on the outskirts of the other uh, set me free painting. Man, I just, there's just something about them, like being in front of them that it's just amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love when kind of artists create on non-traditional mediums because then the work now takes on the context of those, of that kind of surface um, beyond the canvas. So like the doors that you had from the first day I saw them, it was like, wow, you know, this is a, it's a two door experience. <laughs> um, and it's so interesting because the door still can theoretically serve as a door if you choose so seeing that work that you did on a refrigerator where it's like it was interesting because it it got me thinking about like what's the shelf life of a refrigerator i know that maybe is kind of wild but that was the first thing because like with technology or things like that i understand like a computer is going to get old. It will get replaced because there will be a better computer to do the job more efficiently. But when you see then, once you transform that refrigerator into art, now it can be even whether the refrigerator loses its functionality or not, it can work as a sculpture. And that can go on for as long as someone takes care of it. Yeah. But I... I, I also started to think about like, so now the person who has it is using it as a refrigerator though, right? Um, I don't know exactly how they're going to use it, but um, it might just be for art. Might you know, they might have the one one bottle of Cristal in there and the, and that's, <laughs> it only opens when, you know, they close a, a big deal or something. <laughs> I like that. I like that. No, I think it's 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 interesting because then it's like I'm looking at my refrigerator in here, which I just unplugged during our session. I'm like, oh man, might get a Dominic Lopez on that. Just tag it up. 
It's white too. So it could fit the theme. So when you're going into the studio, can you give the audience, what is it? What's your process like? Run me, like, let's try and visually um, paint that for the audience. What, what, what does it look like when Dominic enters the space of creating? Well, I would say as like an artist, I live a very structured life. Um, like everything, the, you know, the 24 hours I have in a day, you know, there is a lot of like touch points of structure that I've just always, I just always work better in, in having that structure. But with the structure, there's also like very chaotic moments of life, very chaotic moments of creating. And a lot of times in the creating is just mere play, like in front of the canvas is just being there and allowing whatever wants to come out can come out, you know. But when you're talking about the structure, then is it like, all right, six o'clock, I wake up, brush my teeth, do my hair routine, do a hundred push-ups, eight o'clock, go to the studio. Is it like that? Well, like there's a lot of, you know, things that I can get grounded in. Um, you know, there's a lot of like prayer and meditation. There's, you know, certain things that I do every day that consistently give me, allow me to be more grounded and to be more structured in the day. But the actual creating can last as long as it wants to or as short as it wants to. So what was the longest session and the shortest session? <clears throat> well, I'd say like... A, like sometimes I'll just pop up and I'm just like ready to go. Like whether that's at like 5 a.m. still in still in my underwear and just roll over, do it, and just stop when then I'm tired to go to bed. I mean, it just doesn't – it has no – kind of like the paintings. It's just, a, you know, a fragment of time. There's no really beginning and end to creating – you know, it's just that moment. Yeah, I'm not talking about like, you know, I started this yesterday. It was done on Friday, you know, but it's interesting for me when I talk about my process, when I go into the studio to make work, I can't even start a work unless my studio is a certain way. So I need like all my stuff prepped. And what it looks like is a lot of my work the work I've been doing now is about process and like the actual physical process of doing it. So I'm prepping my canvas a certain way so that when I pull the tape off, the edges are going to look a certain way. I'm priming the canvas a certain tone. So it goes throughout that. So there's, it's very kind of extremely like technical. I know some artists, they say, Hey man, you know, I got to, I got to smoke a J or two before I hit the studio. Like whatever that process is for someone, I find it fascinating because the work, when you're looking at your work, um, it looks very free spirited in certain of it, meaning it has this nice kind of groove to it. But it's interesting because you look at the repetition, you look, you see there's there's there is structure i mean there's when you look at the body of work as a whole you realize okay there's something he's doing repeatedly in his work so one must think like is he sitting there rigidly with you know whether you're using a crank or a crayon or a paintbrush i got to see the i, I was privileged enough to see you touch up certain works before the show and um you know, you're really focused on making sure the work looked whatever little blemish kind of being a perfectionist. So that's why I found it interesting. Does that, does that carry throughout when you start the piece? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of kind of the same routine, like you were speaking of a routine of, you know, how you address dress the canvas and how you do everything. And that's, that's most of the time always there. But what I also allow myself is, you know, once I start, 
things may, you know, take a while to where I feel like they're done, but I'll start them and I'll allow the process to unfold as it, as it needs to be. Um, but I'm also okay with if I, if something needs to go and get out, it gets out. So it's on both, you know, ends of the extreme kind of, of very, you know, like a perfectionist mindset, but also like allowing the play to where it's way, like you said, free spirited. It is, it's like from the spirit, but then there's this also, you know, I, I think it's a lot of times in ourselves, that's the bit of the balance that we have to, you know, if we want to walk the beam, are we, you know, just thinking from the mind and trying to make things perfect? Or are we just so crazy with our spirit self that it's going some way? It's like, you almost have to, you have to allow both. But when you're right in the center of it, it's kind of where like the beauty happens. Yeah, there are a lot of artists when I see them work, there's like, a lot of happy accidents. So like, oh yeah, that was like an intent for it, but it's like, I'm cool with it. And like, I'm not a happy type accident type artist. Some of them, if it's like, if it, if it really, if luck was on my side then that happened. <laughs> so that's the interesting thing about your work as much as on the surface, certain things may look chaotic. Me knowing you, I'm like, no, there's a lot of control here in his work, meaning he wants a certain vision. He has a certain vision. Only you know if you're hitting your target, but I know there's a target versus like, oh yeah, that wasn't part of the target, but sure, now it is. You see the difference? like, And uh, I think that's one of the things I kind of respect about you as an artist is that you have this structure, you have this vision, and you're carrying out that vision to what it actually like that vision, I believe the works you create are those visions and you like the visions you've created. Those are the visions. Like one of the things you said when I curated the show that you had to envision, this is what the show was going to look like. Yeah. You know that it, it's actually basically almost exactly like I thought from the moment, you know, a lot of the large canvases were being created once they were kind of, you know, getting finished, I was like, this, this is how you create it. It was nearly like probably about 95% of what exactly I thought it would be. And, you know, but I also, when we spoke, um, I wanted your like autonomy and your genius to shine through. And it's just so interesting that it kind of came out that way. So it's like, I already kind of knew it would be created like that, but I didn't create it like that. You created like that. So it's like you brought forth the vision of what initially was my vision. So I think in life, it's like a lot of times as we like walk the path, things happen when we put our mind to it or when we kind of have these visions people come along that really like make these things, you know, come to fruition. Yeah. For me, when I'm, when I was looking at the body of work, what I love about it is like the artist is responsible for a hundred percent of the work, the way the work is presented, the way it's curated, the way it's put together. All the variables I had was the space that it was being curated in. And there was some like kind of, when we initially uh, put together the lifeline pieces, initially we we're looking at them in a traditional way. But then I said, you know, we're looking at these massive pieces in a, what I call normal, normal size place with normal size walls. And I think these walls lent uh, to show the true sheer size of the work. So when the challenge of the doors, our first thought was like, okay, these are heavy works. The first, our first concern was security, right? We don't want work just falling over, but I'm also keeping in mind of like, you know what, if we can't show this in a way that is awesome and crazy, then maybe we just have to even pull it. Like I had no problem pulling. 
if we needed to. And so when it came to the lifeline pieces and creating them into these like L brackets that we're going to cover and create an archway for me, putting them in the space, I say, wow, you know, it's not luck that his work lends itself for this type of execution, if that makes sense. Meaning somewhere in my head ahead of time, like his work can be lent that way. Like it was going to work. It came out once I was actually presented and we got down to actually bring it into the space, you know, fixing it up and doing all that. But I think a lot of that stuff was in the back of my mind and it'll be interesting in the near future to curate the whole body of work because that was just such a small segment of a much larger body of work of when all these works were created. So we're, we're about out of our time here. Where can we, uh, where can we find you, Dominic? Where can the audience find you besides art matcher? Well, on Instagram, you can find me at DLO got you D L O G O T U. Um, and you can click on the link to check more artwork out. Uh, but, You'll be seeing me here in the near future, and um, hopefully you can come and enjoy the, the visceral experience that I'll uh, lend myself to you. Yes, and we're hoping once we get that 10,000-square-foot uh, space, we'll be seeing the uh, whole collection in its entirety. Thank you for joining in, guys. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.